I believe we should have our own channel. Uh, uh, the houses of the Oireachtas. Uh, uh, Senator, I've given you a lot of latitude, and we really cannot debate that matter. I'd remind everybody that this is live on television. Would you please remember that we're, we're representing the people? And in 1998, they mocked you and said that you'd be competing with The Simpsons. Well, they did, but uh, <laughs> I think that, uh, that at times now they, uh, they would turn off The Simpsons to look at Shannon there. And, and in accordance with the constitutional duty of an opposition party in a democracy to put the alternative view. We are being asked to consider this matter here and now. So therefore, any of the tests that you would set me fail on the grounds that you don't believe in these. All citizens are free and equal before the law. In 1963, when President John F. Kennedy visited Ireland, it was the first time that television cameras were allowed inside the Dáil Chamber. And through the generosity of the Fighting 69th, I would like to present one of these flags to the people of Ireland. Again in 1984, there was live television when President Ronald Reagan addressed the combined houses of the Erectus. I repeat today, there is no place for the crude, cowardly violence of terrorism. But it took a further six years of controversial and protracted negotiations before regular television access to the Dáil began in 1990. Intent to intervene. Followed by the Shannad one year later. I recall um, the cabinet discussions in, the, in the, the late 80s and the general view was no this wouldn't be a, a good idea and you know this this would change things and it would be abused I mean that was the the normal the normal words now uh, to be honest I didn't care monkeys the motion to actually agree the cameras to come in took place uh, during the period when there was a minority uh, Fianna Fáil led government which had the tolerance of the Fine Gael party, in other words, the Tala strategy. And it may be that that, that contributed to the government of the day, a Fianna Fáil government, agreeing in principle in 1988 on an all-party basis upon which there was no division on the principle to uh, the televising of the law. I did harbour a faint hope that the advent of television might have a civilising influence on the House. But I... And all of us smartened up a bit, and we all were aware very, very quickly of the presence of the cameras, and we did change our attitude. Maybe not so much the contents of our speeches, but we were, we, we were far more aware of the kind of body language. Television access is now taken for granted. Younger TDs couldn't imagine the doll without the TV cameras. But throughout the 1960s, 70s and 80s, they were strictly forbidden in doll or Shannon. I think Charlie's view was that it would happen. Um, because he, he, his view of most of these things, well, it'll, it'll happen eventually. Um, but I, as I recall it, I don't think he was that keen that it would happen in his time. So there was a certain unease among more senior members and more experienced members in the House. Personally, at the time, I didn't see a big deal with it um, and was quite happy to go along with it. Um, but there would have been a lot of unease at the time, hence the restrictions. And it was quite restrictive when it came in initially. Looking back now, I can't understand, you know, I can barely comprehend the doll without television cameras. The penny was uh, rather slow to drop, I have to admit that. And uh, it uh, was the late 80s before there was really a decision made uh, to allow it in, and then subject to pretty strict rules. I think the atmosphere at the time was, you know, we got our head in the sand and we keep it there. And we don't really want the public to see everything we do. We can let them read it, but don't let them see us. I think the doll certainly needed television cameras. And that was before social media became a reality. Uh, we would be locked away in some kind of irrelevance uh, and castigated because people would be getting second-hand opinions as to what we were doing rather than currently being able to see what it is we do, good or bad. This is all part and parcel of letting the public see uh, what we do, what we're saying, and how we do our business. 
there was widespread concern that the politicians would play to the gallery, play to the camera, that they'd be hoping that their soundbite would make the cut for that night's television news. That was the main fear and the principal argument against allowing cameras into the door. Who are forced to drink this. Now I've checked it with standing orders and the word piss is not against the words you're allowed to use in this chamber unless directed at a member. There's a whole range of things that you can't say about your, col uh, co about your colleagues in the house. You cannot accuse them of being an acrobat or an acrobat at a circus. You cannot accuse them of barking or grunting, of being a brat or acting the brat of being a chancer, of being a clown, a clown in a circus, a comedian, a communist, a corner boy, a cur, a fascist, a gurrier, a gutter snipe. I, I think it's again fair to say that it's only in recent years, and certainly long since I left here, uh, that um, uh, you began to get a bit of grandstanding from some people who... Uh, would be among the more exotic members of the doll. So I have a present for you, Minister, and I'm going to give it to you now. Well, I would hope that we are not into the grandstanding, really, from the independent benches. And I think we have been very fair in the issues that have been pursued by independents. I respected your sincerity. I'd ask you to respect mine. You don't seem to be very sincere. Well, all due respect in the most unparliamentary language. you, Deputy Stike. You. Eight, eight. I suppose the other thing, if I could say, is, and I'm conscious because I was a teacher for a long time in a secondary school, um, when there are student groups in the gallery, I can sit there at times and I cringe at the behaviour of adults and the way in which they, you know, it, it can become very vicious, it can be very nasty, and it's almost like you can see the knife being put in and being turned. and. My own students have been in at various stages and they'd say to me, how can you, how can you sit there and you know, put up with that sort of behaviour? You wouldn't let us go on like that in the classroom. People expect a little more from their parliamentary representatives and occasionally it has descended into less than uh, edifying performances on the part of some. In 1966, the then Minister with Responsibility for Broadcasting, Joseph Brennan, told Shanna Theron, that there was not the slightest hope of having television coverage of either house of the Erechthus. The government was entirely opposed to it and no party wanted it. I'm glad he was wrong. He certainly, along with many others, probably delayed the arrival of television, but it was inevitable and I think uh, politics within the house and outside the house is the better for it. Remember, this was a total change. I mean, nothing was ever seen of the inside of, of the chamber. Uh, well, I think that was a, a general view at the time, uh, 1968, there, there was a, a, a suspicion of television, if you like, uh, in the context of uh, 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 the Parliament. Uh, it was uh, feared that it was open to manipulation. Irish politics are very conservative. Um, this was a new change. This would be intrusive. This would see people perhaps not speaking as well as they should speak or not having the passion that is needed sometimes in a debate. It was an innovation and conservatives sometimes are frightened of change for change itself. I think all parliaments the world over have the same problem which is a deep inbuilt conservatism um, in terms of the organisation of the parliament. I mean to this day unless you have been a parliamentarian you're not allowed into the doll. You know, even to this day, or if any of us want to go and observe the doll in practice, we're not allowed to write anything down on paper unless we happen to be journalists. And I think that lends itself again to the, to the question of how the TV cameras were delayed for so long in getting in. There was this fear on the part of the authorities of the parliament that bringing uh, television in was going to be some sort of insidious contribution to the way in which democracy runs. And of course it was proven wrong. It didn't make that much difference at all. The decision to broadcast all proceedings came very late, in coming only 25 years ago. I'd love to have been in the Dáil, for example, at the time of the arms crisis, to see the effect of the dramatic announcements at that time. In a way, it, these were the most shocking events in the history of this state. By shocking, I mean not, not so much scandalous, as they must have really shocked the people in the chamber uh, when uh, Mr. Hockey, um, departed as minister, when uh, Mr Blaney had to depart as minister, and was, when Mr Kevin Boland resigned. But since 1990, those moments when history is made in Leinster House have been broadcast by the television cameras, accessible to a live audience, 
and recorded for posterity. I have done the state some service. They know it. No more of that. But the line wasn't even original, you know. <laughs> it was effective, I suppose, at the same time. The one that I use with my students would be Enda Kenny's apology for the, in relation to the Madeleine Laundries. I think there, you know, it, there was a strong piece of theatre in, in, in that example. As a society, for many years, we failed you. We forgot you, or if we thought of you at all, we did so in untrue and offensive stereotypes. But it was less to do with the oratory. It was more just the raw emotion, particularly at the end of that speech. This is a national shame for which I say again, I'm deeply sorry and offer my full and heartfelt apologies. I felt he was very genuine. I felt it was a heartfelt apology. He had met some of the women and the women were in the gallery. And I do know from some of the women I met and I would be involved with Justice for Magdalens that they believed him. Um, and they believed that the right thing would finally be done. When the dark midnight is over, watch for the breaking of day. Let me hope that this day and this debate, excuse me, heralds a new dawn for all those who feared that the dark midnight might never end. Something that wouldn't necessarily come through on a text in, in a dull debate, printed. That's right, as scripts, as, as something written on paper, you wouldn't get the full impact. The fall of the, the Albert Reynolds government would have probably been the more iconic one at the time uh, during my period there. Quite dramatic in the House because it was the first time, I think, where government literally changed sides during the course of a parliament. And literally the television could capture that. The key issue throughout this entire episode has been accountability. The most galvanizing uh, performance that I saw, and I saw it subsequently on television, uh, was when Dick Spring uh, moved from the Taunish to slot in the Fianna Fáil Labour coalition led by Albert Reynolds and Dick Spring. Uh, when Dick Spring moved to the uh, Labour slot away from the cabinet front row, if you like, and very slowly but deliberately started to set down the points moving to the end conclusion that the government of Fianna Fáil and Labour was over. I believe it would be obvious to the House that neither I nor any of my colleagues can vote confidence in the government at the conclusion of this debate. And people in pubs across the country, because it coincided with the six o'clock news. All of my Labour colleagues in Cabinet and all of the junior ministers who are members of the Labour Party will resign from their offices before this vote is taken. People uh, actually saw at first hand democracy working and a government falling apart. I can always vividly recall that moment as a backbench deputy, literally seeing the power being sucked away from the government side across the chamber, literally in a debating format because the numbers had gone and the Labour Party had left. I want to take the opportunity of thanking Kathleen, my children and my grandchildren. And you had the Fianna Fáil I thought a government, uh, if you like, hanging on for a day or two, but the inevitable was about to happen. I thank them indeed for their commitment and for staying the course with me. And I look forward, as they do, and there was a very happy family there this morning to say farewell. Thank you. It is when viewing these historic images that one appreciates just how many significant events Leinster House has witnessed, of which we have no visual record. The public missed a lot, missed out on a lot, uh, in terms of the, the, the quality debaters of, of yesteryear, uh, and, and people who, by sheer personality, would have been quite interesting to see live on television and reported also. Another big event I think that was very dramatic was the speech by a former Taoiseach, the late Garrett Fitzgerald, on the appointment of Mr Hawhey as Taoiseach, when he used the words flawed pedigree, for which he was much criticised in his early days in office, but which in the end captured Mr Hawhey with everything that came to pass in the years in between and led to his resignation eventually in 1992. Well, I think it would have been interesting if the there was a video record of the debate uh, on the uh, attempted importation of arms by, uh, with the support of members of the then government who were 
had just been dismissed, that debate of 1970, which went on all night and well into the following day, uh, ought to be on television. Obviously, we have a written record of everything that was said, but that written record doesn't convey the atmosphere in the same way as tele television would have done. I think the political career of Frank Tusky would have been manifestly different if there had been live television in the House, because he was Charlie Hawhey's great adversary. And he transformed, Frank Lusky, transformed the order of business, which was just a reading out of the subject matter for work for the day, into this cross-examination of the Taoiseach. And Hawhey hated every second of it. And the journalists themselves would have said it at the time, that the only person who held uh, Hawhey to account, and the only one whom Hawhey hated, uh, it was not Gareth Sturt, it was Frank Lusky. There's an undertaking to I amend the standing fairness. orders. It can I be sorted be out in jig time, and everybody will, ha fairness. will live happily ever I after, Chan Corley. So, well, by Chan Corley. The Donald debate, the official record of what's said in the House, includes many references to interruptions. It's, it's, not, it's not an order anymore. Really, right? sure it's, it's, it couldn't it's not, be more an order. It couldn't be more an order, Chan Corley. People get up and interrupt. A lot. I, it, it, I, I, I want to give the Taoiseach an opportunity Nobody to reply, Frank Corley. It's, it, it's, it's only reasonable I that... I call Deputy Ferris, it is not relevant to the order of business and we can't proceed like that. And they, they do that, I suspect, with the cameras. You know, there's the, the point of order is used an enormous amount uh, as well. And I think that's probably for the camera because when they make points of order, they're nearly, nearly always out of order. I'm asking you, please, to sit down. If you do not sit down, I will have to ask you to leave the house for the rest of the day. I'm asking you, I'm asking you to sit down. Deputy Morgan, leave the house. Uh, Tall 62, Neil 46. The proposal is agreed to. Television has a tendency to alter the shape of what it seeks to report. Parliamentary business is no different. TV has arguably put added strains on the office of Count Corla. There are certain things you have to protect and insist upon, and that is the right to ask a parliamentary question, the right to get a full answer, and where possible that you're not prevented from raising issues of importance. Is the job of Cahirlach uh, in Shana there, has that been uh, changed by television? <sighs> Uh, well, I don't know whether it, uh, whether it has or not. The, the Cahirlach has to operate within standing orders and your rule w with standing orders and precedent. And, uh, of course, if there's an issue that, that a senator is trying to raise that he knows is, or she knows is going to capture the imagination of the public, they're going to play to the gallery, as you say. Uh, the Cahirlach has to rule then with, uh, from precedent and from standing orders. And uh, it may be difficult at times to, um, to get the message across to the senator that's raising the point. I think the last few Count Corlias um, have had to change their ways um, because of TV. Because if they were seen to be uh, too harsh and uh, following standing orders too harshly, uh, the public didn't like that. Um, if they were too lenient, you know, uh, it, it, was a, it, was a, it was a different thing. What is your point of order, Deputy Kenny? What is your point of My order? My point of order is, am I entitled to explain to this House why I do not agree with the proposal of the Taoiseach? You are not, you are not, you are not in order to do that until such a time, until it's in accordance with the order of the House today, because we cannot have a debate on it, because that has already been agreed to. John is a legal, a legal mind um, and a very good orator, and um, I, I think John had decided he was going to impose the rules uh, and he, he was going to you know, be very stern and be very but and forth. Like you can, win, you can win the argument, as he did in a few of those things, but it looks terrible. Some issues of the day can be uh, raised uh, by members who feel that they want to get more exposure and they feel that if they have the right issue, that they can get the television, whether it's the six o'clock news or the Oireachtas report. And uh, from that point of view, uh, the television plays a huge, a huge role in the issues that are raised outside of the legislation that goes through the Houses. And it is only fair to other members of the House that the standing order should be enforced. Well, I'm sure you want to know what Healy Ray got as well yourself. Uh, and I suppose... It, it was an orchestrated attempt by, by the opposition, uh, knowing John, 
an honest temperament. I will remind the deputy. Quiet now, I will remind the job. You won't say quiet to me, sir. Oh. I suppose when I went there first, you know, the Count Corder was a senior figure, and if you, Count Corder spoke to you, you know, that was it. You didn't have to be told a second time. And a former uh, Count Corley used to say, don't let them provoke you, deputy. And uh, this was a, a means of trying to dissuade one from getting into the banter across the chamber of uh, sniping at one another, which happens all too sadly from time to time. The exception in Kerry is that you now have no power down there and you, you want you to use not, your power you up here. You are not entitled. You are not entitled. I and entitled. I will not tolerate it, sir. You are not entitled. You are not entitled. You are not entitled. I am not entitled. You are not entitled. If you want to continue this now, can I call Be seated, be seated, please, while the chair is standing. You are not entitled. You are not entitled. You are not entitled to drag the chair onto the House in matters of public controversy and you are not entitled to breach standing orders. That is all I'm saying, Deputy. I wouldn't like to see the Ciarán Corla in a classroom because I don't think he would last too long. Uh, my experience of teaching, it takes a certain firmness and a certain fairness in order to keep that calm um, and to ensure that people are heard and are respected. And I think there certainly have been some um, letdowns on that. I might remind you that I already broke that rule on the formation of government when I quoted you speaking about the Greens as wacky people who ate um, munchies and cereals and that kind of sandal-bearing outfits. That was your own quotation to Count Corla, so I've already again, breached that. I will again ask Deputy Kinney, I will again ask Deputy Kinney to show due deference to the House and to the Chair uh, and act uh, with an appropriate amount of dignity. Use a bit of judgment. Use a bit right. of judgment. It is a parliament and people you know, do need to get their point across and various tactics are used. And you make allowances at times. You don't, you know, uh, intervene too often. And, and you see it with Sean Barrett all the time. Uh, he reminds us uh, regularly that the people out there are watching this. Roaring and shouting is getting nowhere. Yeah, here, here. You're an embarrassment on television. Here, here. I have to remind members from time to time that you know, people make phone calls and they phone into my office and the staff have to take these messages where people are expressing their disgust. As television has become part of the Oireachtas furniture, politicians are turning their attention to how best to use it. What are the qualities in a politician? I mean, when politicians are being selected at convention now, is being, what the old phrase, good on the box, is that, is that important? Good on the box is an essential part because that's where the stage is for a lot of the time. Good on radio in many respects, in my view, is more important because people tend to, to listen to what it is you say on a radio programme as distinct from getting distracted by what's happening or what kind of tie you're wearing or how you might look, and particularly for women, women politicians. So that's certainly part and parcel of the medium of communication that 21st century politics in a democracy has to deal with. Uh, but if you're in the Senate, you have to make the issue that you have, you have to make the best impact that you can in the little time that's available to you. Leading politicians had to appear on the box long before the doll was on television. I mean, James Dillon gave interviews and Sean Lamass and all of that. So uh, I don't think that was a, that's a new thing. I was elected in May 1968, and about a week later, um, I was told uh, by an official that... Uh, uh, a number of deputies had asked uh, for training in television. I think if you look around at all, what strikes you is not that everybody is uniformly televisual, but the fact that there's huge variety in the doll, people of all ages and shapes and, you know, <laughs> sartorial taste. And I think that, therefore, television is not having the effect of making, you know, privileging, privileging a particular televisual type. I remember um, Pao Donald turned to Tom Kine and said, uh, and they were much, much older than I was. I was in my 20s. They would have been in their late 60s, I think. Uh, they, uh, I remember O'Donnell said to Kine, God, Tom, he said, I don't know whether this television thing is going to take off in terms of politics, but if it does, I think you and I can forget about it. Young O'Malley might have a future in it, all right. And who are the, who are the best people at exploiting the, the, the soundbite, hoping that it will make the cut for the six o'clock news? Pat Rabbit is absolutely brilliant. Mary Lou MacDonald would be very good at it. Claire Daly on other occasions. People who, who are best at delivering the message to the cameras, I suggest tend to be 
uh, the opposition, the independents, because they have to make an impact on what, what they say, and governments and ministers tend to read from scripts. Pat Rabbit is uh, gifted in that respect. Uh, well, there's a number of them uh, well capable of it, including some of the semi-clothed ones. So. I think probably Sinn Féin would be best at it. One of the contributors uh, to this programme said, that, well, the best people for, as it were, using television would be the Sinn Féin group. Well, I don't know whether to take that as a compliment or not. The Joe Higgins has that capacity. It's Joe Higgins. Joe Higgins. Kilcoyle was abroad for um, several days uh, on political work advancing the cause of, uh, of socialism. <laughs> and Joe has been very prone to really coming up with some classic one-liners uh, from, from the opposition side, and I put it down to his dingle lyricism. Yes, you can imagine, Count Cole, how perplexed I was when I came back to find my wardrobe almost empty. <laughs> uh, the Taoiseach had been in busy robbing my clothes. <laughs> now, I know up to recently the, the PDs hadn't just stitch left by the same Taoiseach. But we never expected him to take a walk on the left side of the street. That quip about Bertie um, gets replayed and it is the classic one of um, Bertie's a socialist uh, and, and, and Joe coming back saying, I, someone stole my clothes. Joe Higgins had very carefully rehearsed spontaneous outbursts, uh, which when you heard them the first time, uh, you would be impressed and then you would realise that he was reading it or uh, rehearsing it and had rehearsed it. Now he's not alone, Winston Churchill famously rehearsed all of his famous speeches. It was once uh, in an office location close to another well-known deputy who was a master of the, uh, the quip or the, the quick retort. It wasn't all as spontaneous as the cameras or people watching might believe. I heard practice going on on the evening before and rehearsals taking place in the adjoining office. And I thought first, good Taoiseach, there's two of us in it, we'll go down together. <laughs> what all this is about, it has nothing to do with the murder which was appalling of those uh, three is is Israeli kids. It's nothing to do with it. The Israeli police knew that Hamas had nothing to do with it before this war. It took some time for TDs and senators to take for granted the cameras in both houses of the Oireachtas. And when plans were announced to televise all party specialist committees, it was first mooted that because cameras were already installed in the Shannon chamber, it would make an ideal venue for committee work. This idea failed to impress senators on all sides of Shannon Theorem. Is it, in fact, because there's television in this house and not in the others that we are being asked to, to make way for this committee. And without a shadow of a doubt, it reduces it to a community centre. I mean, uh, having it for one thing next week, we'll probably have, it, will it be available for a rock concert the following week? One would have to question at the end of the day. Well, I think we hadn't many uh, committee rooms at that particular time. Uh, there was a new wing built to Leinster House since then, LH2000, where we have quite a number of committee rooms which are kitted out with cameras and uh, there might be uh, a conflict as to who might get the chamber. So you couldn't have that situation, I would think, because Parliament takes precedent and no committee can tell a Parliament as to when it might sit or where, when it might not sit. Many politicians are agreed that television access is best suited to the big door location, Budget Day, the making or breaking of governments. We lived just opposite All Hollows College and uh, the only way of being able to relay the budget back to my father and all the other uh, workers in All Hollows was to, uh, to listen uh, to a bit that came out um, by reporters from, from budget day and then run up to tell them what was in the budget. And now you could be up there watching it on your phone and sitting in the same spot. You would be inundated with requests to be able to come and get into the gallery and to hear live, hot off the pages, so to speak, changes in taxation or changes indicated for law. That now has all disappeared. Budget day has lost an awful lot of the uh, excitement and the dramatic tension that it used to have because television has facilitated live coverage uh, and commentary at the same time. And 
I think that as a result, it's, it's, it's a better um, way of communicating changes in taxation, changes in law, uh, which is what a budget speech is about. Things changed a bit. Uh, I, I did my first budget, 92, and I think maybe 93 again. By 94, uh, we, we had decided that going through, the, the tradition had been since the start, um, uh, that in budget day you put everything on the record. Everything was read into the record, all the accounts and the various schedules and assessments were read. Uh, we decided that this was too long. Uh, the normal budget day, it was two, two and a half hour speeches, I think my first one was. And then we said, listen, TV, you're going to lose them. And particularly if the practice of the Department of Finance was to put the main issues near the end, you're going to lose all your audience. So um, I think we decided that this, this wasn't the way to go. We had to shorten it, uh, put it on schedules, um, say look at the principal features of the budget, which in the old days used to be very little um, after TV. They had everything and you kept your budget to the core points of interest and again I think that was a good, a good thing. And television access is also well suited to the cross-questioning of witnesses called to account by the all-party Oireachtas committees. Well I think uh, television made a big difference for example in the uh, dirt inquiry. It, it made a big difference because it allowed people to see uh, you know what was happening and if you can see something and see the people involved, uh, it's different to just reading it afterwards. And that's why I uh, always regretted very much that, uh, uh, for example, the Beef Tribunal was never uh, televised. If it had been, uh, I think if, uh, the impact it made, even though it was a major impact, would have been even greater, much greater. A lot of the the new members of Dáil Éireann, and after the last election there's an awful lot of new members, they do not appreciate, in my view, um, what it was like in the committees in the old days. Because in the committees in the old days, I remember I, I, remember I sat in the early 80s on a consolidation bill of social welfare, and you know, you might as well have been in outer space, nobody knew you were, you were doing it. Where now the committees are covered on TV. Um, very well and if there's something good on the committees it's covered very well and a, a member a backbench member serving on a committee will get so much more exposure now um, in, in, in our earlier days that was a, a useless exercise. The interesting thing about these inquiries which the public would criticise them for is they never seem to make harsh findings and where there is wrongdoing nobody ever goes to jail but I have felt for a long time after the tribunals here, that the biggest sanction in Ireland is actually exposure. People knowing that you've done something that's not completely kosher. I'm not terribly enthused about gotcha politics. And there is a tendency to try to play the gotcha game, you know, to have somebody held up uh, for you know, public um, excoriation by members of a committee. That, is something that uh, is not, it, and television probably increases the incentive to do that sort of thing because you get the reaction shots and the people being dismayed at what's being said and all that sort of stuff. I, I think the banking inquiry is a very good example of a, exactly how a, a committee system can work really well. Now, of course, there's terrific interest in that because we're pursuing, you know, we're, we're dealing with something that happened in the past and we're always more comfortable dealing with things that happened in the past. If, for example, we were to be looking at you know, the future of paying for the health services uh, 25 years from now, given our demography, and, had a and, and only a committee could consider that, I wonder would that be quite as, as attractive uh, television uh, for the public, even though it might be more important than talking about the past. The committee work is, is one area where I think the television cameras really have come into their own. Uh, and, and there it's quite interesting to see how, you know, parliamentary committees are, are quite a recent phenomenon in our system, in the Irish system. Um, so now we have parliamentary committees, we have the modern uh, setup, they have these beautiful design new bill, um, facilities and the cameras are in the room. So now we can get the, the fine detail of the development of legislation in a way that we never had before. Some of the committees are uh, more keenly followed by journalists. The Public Accounts Committee, for instance, would be a particular case in point. 
the Health Committee could be sitting on the same day and dealing with very, very important and pertinent issues that warrant a greater public uh, exposure. But we might not get the attention. Didn't they, didn't they? I think Mr Goulding's statement says, says there was a joint venture with you. They didn't. And I have the letter here yeah. in front of me and I'm quite happy, uh, Deputy, to read it into the record. But when you're getting the live stuff, the real stuff, you're getting something really quite special, especially if it's a, a committee in action in full flight. Continuously came across people in the street who said, I watch it all morning. And then you come across the, the guy in the street saying, you know, you didn't give it to him hard enough or you didn't challenge him hard enough and you should have said this and you should have said that and you should have said the other. So they say those sort of things, yeah. You're almost describing it, though, as a form of reality TV. Yeah, it is reality TV in, in, many, in many ways. It is, yeah, and people get deeply involved in it and deeply passionate about it and, and deeply uh, supportive of some of the, you know, they're cheering for one side or the other. And that's, that's I don't know if that's an upside or a downside, but it's certainly a consequence. Today's politicians take television very much for granted. They are conscious of the impact it can make. But sometimes they can be surprised by who is paying attention. The exchange I had with Kevin O'Kalon um, on, on the Northern Bank raid. I do not believe for a moment that your continual outbursts and allegations have anything to do with a bank robbery in Belfast but everything to do with votes in Ballyboch and in Ballyconnell and everywhere else throughout this jurisdiction. And let me, let me remind, well, you know, and that went on for several hours. Punishment tact, 19 year old man shot both hands, believed responsibility for provision IRA. The other day, 19 year old man shot in both ankles in an alley, Serbia Street, Lower Falls, believed to be responsibility. And blah, blah, blah and it was ding-dong. I think, with respect to you, that you have a neck on you trying to uh, label any other political party with the criminality tag. If, if, if you're trying to say that uh, Prime Minister Blair uh, was trying to make a deal on Christmas week uh, that allowed criminality to go ahead or, or decommission, that is not the case. You know that. You, you know that is not the case. We had a serious debate which was massively watched um, by the unionist community um, in Northern Ireland. Uh, and I know, I didn't know on the day, uh, but I subsequently knew how important that was um, for, for that relationship. Do you have any idea at all, Taoiseach, of the damage that has been done, the serious damage that has been done by your baseless allegation against Gerry Adams and Martin McGuinness and the broad Sinn Féin leadership? And for everybody else too, because it was important to confront that. There will be those of us who are free citizens who happen to enjoy the status of being married. And there will be those of us who are free and able to enjoy the status of having a civil partner. And there will be those of us who will be able to have children naturally, if possible, naturally with medical assistance or by adoption. And there will be those of us in loving couple relationships who will not be able to have that right. And I was quite amazed to find that, in fact, an awful lot of people had actually seen that piece, uh, particularly with the LGBT community. And therefore, it was just reinforced to me uh, the, the power that television has. Uh, but it is on condition that members behave as a parliamentarian, debating something and making the case and making it with, I would like to think, a bit of passion uh, and conviction behind the cause that they're articulating. And with the continuing revolution in information technology, what impact will all of that have on parliamentary proceedings? What does the future hold? A good example of that would be recently in loan parents, uh, the cutbacks to loan parents loans, for example. I've raised that consistently in the DOI. It doesn't get the kind of attention in mainstream media that one would like, but in terms of social media, we can target that audience. We can actually put the message and get that message out to the audience that's affected by that cut. They can, they can go in online uh, uh, at the moment. We have an app as well where people can use to connect into the Oireachtas uh, website. Uh, but that's the way forward, I think. I think in the first instance, television didn't make a big difference, at least in the Irish case, certainly. I think the difference has been more recent. I think it's television combined with social media and the possibility to, uh, you know, for political players and for journalists to direct the audience into the doll chamber 
through the, the linkage between the television camera and their social media device. I think that's where we're beginning to see television now potentially coming of age. All this type of uh, different media that we have today, little bits and pieces and gossip, I think displays an, an even more importance on having live television and radio coverage available to the public of what goes on in the committees in the Dáil and Shannon. Parliaments in Western democracies are by nature conservative institutions when it comes to procedures, formats, protocols, and few of them did not initially resist the television camera. It would reduce Parliament to a peep show. The camera itself was nothing less than an instrument of torture. But eventually they decided to let the monster in. What of the Irish experience? What has been television's impact? The order of business was a boarding in the old days, an order of business. Uh, it was read out um, that this is what's on today and it'll end at some such so time and that. But the order of business took on a new edge uh, when it was on it was it was on TV and became the kind of the key uh, the key issue of, of of the day. You know, a picture tells its own story, and somebody standing up and speaking and making a point can't really be distorted other than uh, very negative editing. That's much better, notwithstanding that fear, than a printed version or a commentary on how somebody might have spoken or behaved in the course of a debate. It's very important if you're serious about your politics and if you're a serious parliamentary democracy that there's a record of what they're all reacting to and I think that's what's so terribly valuable about the broadcast record of Dáil proceedings. Presume that to lots of members being on is very important. The exposure that uh, you get from being on the television is huge, particularly for people who are going for the doll. I'm quite amazed at the number of people who will say to me, we saw you on TV, and, I'm, and it's the Oireachtas TV that I'm talking about, uh, people who sit and they watch during, for a few hours every day. I think it's a fine thing. I think it's an important thing that people out there, the electorate, citizens right across the country, have the opportunity to inform themselves and evaluate the performance of the people that they entrust to go forward and to represent them. Also by people outside Dublin Central who will contact me because of a particular issue that I brought up, whether it's at leaders' questions or priority questions or whatever. So the, the calls do come in and people are watching Oireachtas TV. And I think that does have the desired effect of making the dial more relevant to the public and to the people and making them closer more closely connected to their parliamentary democracy. That's an ongoing challenge for us, but I think the television cameras have helped enormously. The pluses, I think, are very obvious. The pluses are that as TDs we're all accountable, much more accountable, for everything we say and everything we do, and it's obviously far more accessible uh, to the public what we say and what we do. It's, it means they can they can tune into all sorts of various instruments and programmes to see what's going on. And that's a fantastic service. It's, it's very, very important. Everybody seems agreed that television access is necessary and with many positives. But what, if any, are the negative consequences? Inevitably, I think you, you find yourself forced by circumstances uh, into a sort of soundbite uh, activity which uh, isn't really very good but uh, can't uh, be avoided and unfortunately television pay plays that up uh, because uh, if uh, it's been retransmitted say in the news that night well they're not going to put on five or ten minutes of someone speaking uh, they're going to put on five seconds and ten seconds sound bites. The downside is that people, TDs and senators being so conscious of the cameras they exploit them uh, to the extent that they appeal to the kind of lowest common denominator, that you get tabloid television, that you get uh, tabloid, a tabloid doyle. One of the things I think is very important, which we have not succeeded in doing, which I tried to get in when I was there in, 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 as leader of the House, is an orderly interruption. You know, will the member in possession please yield? And then you make a point, which can be no longer than 30 seconds, and the member then can respond. There's, there is a, a facility for that on the Dáil, in the Dáil orders, but it doesn't happen uh, because people are so time limited, everyone has 10, 15 minutes, nobody will yield a minute to somebody else because that means going off script. 
But if you want to have a doll that's fit for television all the time, I think you need to allow the possibility of that sort of interruption. And if you did allow that sort of interruption, you would probably have more people sitting in the chamber as well, because the possibility of listening to what the other person was saying, and if there's something that needs to be either contradicted or applauded, that you can interrupt to do so, uh, I think would lead to a better attendance and a, a doll that would, would work better, as I say, on television. After every election, there are fewer and fewer politicians in Leinster House who can remember the Oireachtas without television. Cameras have become, literally, part of the furniture. Do you know where the cameras are in the Senate? Yes. Why do you think, know where they are? Well, I think everybody knows where they are. <laughs> and, uh, of course, there are two TVs in the televisions in the chamber as well. There is no hiding place. The, my sense as a leader proofing candidates for the future, that sort of communications competency is growing as a criterion by which one judges the selection of candidates. And that may be unfair because people have many attributes and many strengths in life and some people could be a very effective legislator but not necessarily a great communicator. Um, but I do think that idea of prospective candidates having a communication capacity is a, is, is a product of the televisation of the dial. I think in the case of the students, the box is making a difference, that they're seeing the politicians in a way that previous generations of students wouldn't have seen. But I would argue that, if anything, social media is even more important. Uh, you know, students are engaging on Twitter with politicians directly. You know, they're, they're asking questions of politicians and they're getting responses from politicians. They're liking them on Facebook or not liking them or whatever you might want to, to call it. So they're able to engage in a way that that wasn't possible. And I think television is, is a means by which the politicians can help that process. So it's a, it's a mechanism, it's a tool, but it's by no means the main driver, I think. In my office, and the greater number of deputies not being in the chamber are in their offices doing other work, but following the debate. And on our remote controls, we have the opportunity to scan the chamber. We can pop right round, just at the flick of a switch. That's something people at home don't have the facility to do currently. Um, I think that would be a very interesting development, that people will be able to have a more holistic in the round view of what's actually taking place in the chamber. The, the future, we now have an Oireachtas channel. And recently the officials came in to explain to us uh, what this was going to be all about, what it means. And I suppose if I was to contrast that with 1989, when the Parliamentary Party was briefed on cameras coming into to the Doyle and people really being kind of worried and wary and cautious and what does this mean, a drought to get us and on the minus. This discussion this time was about opportunity. How do you use it? How do you avail of it? How can it be of use to you as a TD uh, in terms of your needs to communicate issues and the party's needs and the politician's need? And there's no sense of worry at all about the fact that there's going to be an Oireachtas channel devoted to capturing everything in the dial. The issue was, how do I get on it? We now have our own uh, Oireachtas channel and what I want to see eventually, during my term, I was hoping that it would be possible, is that you'd open your newspaper in the morning and you'd look to see what's on the various television stations and you'd see a rock to television. And you could pick and choose. Uh, you know, the, perhaps the debate you want to tune into. But above all, it was widening the, uh, the scope of what happens in Leinster House. It's not just the Dáil Chamber, it's the committee structure, which is becoming exceptionally important in my book. And that you now have a situation where the committee stages of bills, where we debate the content and the toing and froing, are now being done in committees, which is good to television, if you like, because it gives a greater understanding to the public of what is actually being proposed. So all of this progress has stemmed from way back in the 80s where we had live broadcasting by radio to the 90s where we got the television and now to an Oireachtas channel. And like at the end of the day, uh, the public should be entitled to uh, see and hear what's going on in the Parliament. And it's forcing us to actually change the way we do our business.